welcome to this uh, AI Inspire. My name is uh, Odd Gurven, uh, and I'm project manager at uh, Norwegian Cognitive Center. Uh, today's speakers will be simplified. Uh, it will be electric frames, Bergen Robotics, and IDN, Capgemini, and Lada on their project, uh, Lada Medical. Uh, first, I have a small introduction for uh, Norwegian Cognitive Center. Uh, behind the center, this is an uh, industry uh, initiative, and behind the center are the industrial clusters uh, in the west coast of Norway. Uh, together with IBM as our technology partner, we have gathered a consortium uh, behind us, and uh, we deliver a, a package, uh, a program designed for uh, enhance uh, faster product development and use of AI, uh, meaning uh, we will help you to transform products and services, transform operations, enterprise or customer experience. And all we want to do is to uh, be uh, together with you developing your competitive, uh, competitive uh, advantage. Uh, and we have a lot to offer you if you're interesting. It is due to the project, we have IBM Watson platform free of charge for your use. We have AI competence who can develop uh, together with you the, pro, um, the AI project quite uh, long um, into the project uh, phases free of charge. We have a learning arena who is uh, you are participating in now. We help you with public funding. We have guidelines for how to develop AI. We also have a lab that you can work in. We also have two different startup initiatives. One is for uh, researcher and students uh, together with Nora. And we have one commercial uh, uh, together with IBM. You will find all the information about this on our web pages. Uh, we also help clients finding students to their projects, and we have uh, um, uh, helped several companies uh, into their uh, AI journey. Uh, and with this, I will uh, stop share my screen and send the word over to Eric. Thank you. Simplify. Yes, uh, I would also start by uh, sharing my screen then. Yes, can you all see the screen? Yes. 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 Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you, Old, and um, it's a pleasure, definitely. So um, I was putting up this presentation and then I was uh, thinking this must have been close to the 50th uh, talk that I've had uh, over the years about uh, working with AI and how we have been uh, working and how we would be making a difference so um, I have uh, angled this presentation a little bit differently, but I would be sure that it is equally interesting, if not more. So first, a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, my name is Eric Leung. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Simplify, which have uh, recently been acquired by Elo, a publicly trading company. If I were to describe myself, I would consider myself a visionary technologist. I work a lot with technology ever since uh, during my school years. And ever since then, I have worked really hands-on to less hands-on to from the bird's eye view, working with companies, management on how to utilize technology to achieve business value. So a background of computer science and engineering. So I would naturally have um, the, the competence within both the software and the hardware aspect. Of course, nowadays we can program uh, freely without having to think about the resources of the machine. But from the early days, uh, memory usage and CPU usage has uh, become a very 
big topic within programming. And ironic enough, we're starting to get back to that point again, when AI is practically draining a lot of resources and CPU is no longer sufficient. So it's like taking a whole cycle from start to finish. My expertise is on the B2B software. Uh, it's a very different ball game comparing to um, B2C. In the business world, everything is about value. Why do we do something? Why do we buy a service? How exactly would that help our business? So nobody buys anything because it's cool, because it's a, it's a hype or because our next door neighbor has it. It's very different. So in the early days, I worked a lot with CRM systems. But later on, I was also, uh, by a chance, being introduced to IBM Watson. Uh, and it kickstart my journey in, uh, along the path of uh, working with artificial intelligence. And um, Simplify was a company founded in 2017. And uh, at that time, this is the world to us. That's all the buzzword that you can thinking about what people were being, uh, thinking when, uh, when we were talking about AI. So I'm driving Azure, all the buzzword that you can ever think of. And if we fast forward to today, um, yep, data is the new oil. And uh, it has been the, um, the word that has been really the, um, driving how data is important. And a lot of the businesses, the, the multi-billion companies or even trillion companies are thinking about how can we capture data. And um, it has become this uh, arms race of how we can build cool solutions and attract the businesses with the data. And of course, in the context of AI, we can't live without data. So it's very important elements. And uh, it has also been the element that formed our vision when we first started uh, Simplify. But yes, if we fast forward to today, in 2021, this became the hype. This is what we are facing. Instead of talking about AI data, well, we still talk about data, but in a completely different context, instead of talking about the next big thing steering our uh, life and it's gonna change our life dramatically, we're starting to think about, okay, how can we do something without violating one of the privacy laws in this country? And uh, to be honest, I've actually engaged in dialogues with the customer who are considering dropping the use of email and go back to snail mail because that will protect them from for sure without ever having to worry that the information they communicated with the client would not leave the country. So we are in a different world now than when we first started. And we wanted, of course, as a first time founder, working with the high, uh, high bleeding edge technology, wanted to change the world with our solutions, working with AI. And then all of a sudden, a few years down the line, we're looking at this picture, which is quite actually dramatic in a way. And uh, I would like to talk more about how we can actually move forward when in the face of the GDPR regulations, it almost feels like a minefield. So a little bit about us. As I mentioned, we founded um, almost four years ago. We're now closer to 190 employees. And we belong to the bucket of intelligent process automation. The whole vision is about how we can use AI to reduce the need for manual labor in the office space, whether it is customer service, back office processing, or anything that requires a lot of text communication, whether we're talking about chat or email or documents. Hours are spent every day by a lot of, uh, by workers on processing incoming inquiries on email and reading the documents that comes with it. We have the technology based on the natural language understanding to process these inquiries automatically, classify them, sort them, extract the information from it. So, and because of our capability, we have gotten the, um, the honor to work with uh, the national archive agencies to derive a tool to be able to process these uh, incoming inquiries and define whether they are, should be archived or not and with the relevant information. There's a lot more other projects that we have also um, gotten, but this is the one that we define as our signature. Other than that, we are also very strong in the bank and finance as well as uh, telecom. So when we were out working with our clients, um, AI is a very interesting field. We see that 
they are um, very excited about what uh, what we can do for them, and at the same time, they also have some fear. And of course, as a first time founder started a company from zero, we feel like out in the market, we have many competitions. We are fighting constantly against existing vendors, alternative technologies, different way of doing things, or even competitors on the startup world. But the interesting enough, the biggest competition, the toughest, most fierce competition that we face in the market is no other than the status quo. Status quo has been our biggest competitor uh, over the years. And I was making this presentation and then I was thinking, I come here, I deliver the speech, speaking for 15, 20 minutes, everyone gets all fired up. And then what? What I can also imagine most likely is that you get a couple of inspiration from cases. There would also be other very capable speakers after myself and you'll get inspired, but then what? When you go back to your respective organizations discussing with your peer, your um, line organization about, okay, let's do something. And then you will be meeting with a lot of questions. And I would like to talk about how do you deal with those questions? This is a bit of the Norwegian corporate culture as I have understood since I have uh, been in Norway since I was a little kid. It's a very democratic process, which on the outset is very good. But if you dig deeper to it, you'll realize that it is a very consensus based line organization where practically means everybody can say no, everybody can object to something, but in order to move forward, you need enough people to say yes, if not everybody. And this will become always the constant threat that I have been through enough sales cases where you've gone through from the middle management to the top executives to even the, the CTO thinks it's a good idea. And then all of a sudden the, the lawyer says no. Or everyone thinks it's a good idea and then the CFO thinks, okay, but uh, how can we make sure that this is going well, uh, not just now, but three years from now. So you have, there's been an enough process that stops up because one person in the room have skepticism. And it's all because of the fact that everyone is very, very afraid of making mistakes in this country. When we are talking about AI, everybody who works with it would know it's trained based on historical data, the world moves forward. And based on the training data, your model will be at best 99.999%, but there will always be the 0.01% of uh, chances that it, reduce, uh, it reproduces the wrong answer. And that might just be enough to make people scared. They can't live with the consequences. They're not aware of the percentage of the risk as well as the consequence. And therefore it is safer to wait and do more clarification, do more discussions, more meetings and so forth. And of course in Norway, slow and steady will always wins because there are no competitions. You can walk as slow as you want and you don't have to worry about competition catching up to you. Oh, there comes a competition from abroad. Sorry, you don't know this uh, local customs in the Nordics. We have different languages. We have different way of doing business. It's really easy to disregard the competitions from abroad and just keep what we have here in Norway and create a market just for ourselves within the ecosystems. Case in discussions, VIPs has dominated, very good. And when Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, that has really been capturing a lot of the market across the globe, really struggles to come into Norway. It's, it's a very good barrier that we have set for ourselves to make sure that we don't need to innovate and we still have a very good business. So some of the clients we have spoken to, we realized that it, there's a tug of war inside their mind. And I believe that to a high extent, some of you will also have this mindset is that on one end, you really want to innovate. I mean, that's why you all sign up to this webinar today is that you want to find out how we can innovate with new technologies, new way of doing things, create new values. But on the other hand, you're being pulled back. You, you, gotta, you gotta keep track of the regulations. I mean, to be honest, when, I, when I'm reading the GDPR regulations and the scrims, that has came out in uh, October, November last year. You have point that the, Dr. Tilson has pointed out a lot of questions, issues, problems that we have to obey in terms of the regulations. But 
Nobody can tell you how to obey such regulations. There is no clear definition yet. So what's the safest thing to do? Let's wait and see. And of course, management executives want full control. But realistically, there are no such thing as an AI system that is in full control. There will always be the certain um, uncertainty elements within it. And that's why it's artificial intelligence. It's the same as if you hired an employee to do the job, you, have, you can no longer have full control of the task because you have delegated it away to somebody. And of course, even further, some people would like to make sure that they can employ a way of automating the operation, but provide zero change to the operation. Yeah, of course, we can help you automate, but what would be the point of automate when the online organization remains the same? We've helped them with tackling their task, and then they have the free time to go to the, um, go to the coffee break. So this tug of war has been going on a lot inside a lot of management, and it is very important that some people need to put a foot down and say, okay, which way do we lean? We can talk all we want, and we can put up all the regulations to ensure that our private data would not be fall into the wrong hands. And for all means, I'm all for that. It's very important. I've gone as far as to delete my Facebook app, my LinkedIn app from my phone. I have stopped using Google because of uh, the way they were sharing the data. I'm using other browsers. But what we cannot ignore is that while we are having the main focus on the privacy regulations, the rest of the world is running. On the left, you see that there is a graph of the top 10 companies by market cap. And you will see that the top seven up until Alibaba, their main business is about data, it's about AI, it's about how to make things smarter. In, for, for their mind, they are already doing magnificent things from having self-driving cars into be able to predict your next move. And if we were to look into Europe, not even let alone Nordics, but in Europe. This is what we have on this list. The number 13 Nestle will bring us really good coffee and chocolate. And then we have really nice purse in Louis Vuitton and champagne in Moen and Hennessy in France. And then you have a couple of pharmaceutical company. You have to go all the way to rank 56 to get to SOP, which is a company that works with software, let alone data. Yes, you could argue that pharmaceutical companies will use data for their research and so forth. So there's a lot of AI element in it. But ultimately, it's a completely different ballgame when we're talking about working with data on pharmaceutical companies versus working on data to make the world a different place. So are they going to wait for us? I don't think so. And if we were to looking at the consumer market, all of these social platforms that are doing a lot on gathering data, you don't see many from Europe, let alone from the Nordics. So we are go we're slowly walking into the world where our data, our solutions who are the most innovative on the AI front are all based on either from China slash Japan or from the US. There is nothing here left for Europe or even for the Nordics in the long run. I mean, I'm so happy we still have Spotify because there is at least one company that I can name uh, in pride that is coming from the Nordics, but that's as far as you can see. So this is what the risk we will be saving, we will be facing in the long run. If we don't do anything, the AI advancement is getting a lot more popular in the other parts of the world. We will be obliged to use their services. And one day, they decided enough is enough. You do as I say, or else we'll shut you out. We will be left defenseless. So if we don't act, yes, number one, there will be foreign domination. I might even go as far as in arguing that we are already there. We have Facebook at work. We have teams that we use for collaboration in businesses. And if we're talking about the consumer, it's even more crazy. And then, um, by that time, in terms of AI, we would also be facing the risk of having less accurate models. I mean, of course, it would be fine. We would just buy from the foreign, uh, foreign services. But 
If you're buying advanced AI services that are trained based on foreign data, data from the populations in the US, the Asia, Japan, you would expect that those models will be less reflective on our society. So we will end up having to pay more because there are less competition and there will be no local vendors and they get less. And even infinitely worse is that we face the possibilities that the data will flee from uh, what we were trying really hard to guard. I mean, right now we still have the choice. We can force these foreign rulers, uh, the foreign dominations of the service providers to oblige uh, with our regulations. But what if we come to one day where the choice is either you would be left with no such services and you go back to a more previous generations compared to the rest of the world, or you will have to oblige on their terms. So the key takeaway I would like to use um, to, for you to draw today is, yes, we have to act. It's very important. I think everyone knows that, but why? It's because if we don't act now, if we don't start moving forward now and let status quo take over, the consequence could be infinitely worse if we move forward. So I would, as much as I would like to talk about what Simplify work with, but I think it's much more important for me to spend the time today on, there's no, on pointing out the fact that there's no point for us to working with AI if there aren't enough companies to work with when everyone is having this wait and see, let's discuss, and so forth. Let's wait for the regulations to come on board. The data privacy is the hype now. It's not AI. And we need to do something about it. We need to step forward to demand that we have a playing field. We have a playing ground for us to navigate within the regulations to, pro to provide still working with AI. Yes, and we need to fight everyone on this call on status quo. We need to demand actions because if we don't, we sit around, we will pay the price earlier or later. The later we pay the price, the bigger it is unless we're ready to go back to snail mail. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Um, very interesting and very true. <laughs> um, the next presenter is uh, Nils Jakob uh, Berlan and John Kjellevold uh, from uh, um, Electric Friends and Bergen Robotics. Nils Jakob, scene is Here your... we are. Um... Okay, hey, hello everybody. My name is Nils Jakob Balhan. Uh, everybody can hear me. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, presenting together with Jon Kjellevold. He is uh, here hello, too. Here am I. Good. Um, we are going to talk about um, a development we have been doing the past year that has been really, really exciting. And we are uh, very happy to talk about it to you. Uh, first, a bit about Bergen Robotics. We are a small company, of course, located in Bergen. We do AI, camera systems, and robotics. And uh, Jon probably want to say hello and uh, say a few words about Electric Friends. Do you want to say um, a few words about uh, Electric Friends before we, we get into the presentation, Jon? Uh, yeah, we are a company uh, now owned 99.5% uh, by TV2. Uh, we do the uh, robots that you have seen at the TV2 floor, I'm sure, if you watch the news channel or the news from Oslo or Bergen. We have also delivered around 30 of those in, uh, in export markets. But uh, our last development is what we present here today uh, together with uh, Bergen Robotics. Thank you. Okay. Um, the stuff we do that is to replace joystick with AI. There are many, many manual operations in the world and um, AI is replacing a lot of these manual operations. Um, there are many reasons for why we would do this. Some of it may be, might be really dull. Uh, it is dull um, sitting there with your joystick and do manual uh, guidance of a robot. It might also be dangerous. 
um, I show you an example, it might be dirty and it might be also be really difficult to um, steer a robot when the AI can actually do it much better. And in the end, a lot of these things um, is really about money. Um, AI will pay off really soon for some applications where you can replace the good old joystick with a silicon brain. Um, I can show you an example that we are working with in Bergen Robotics. Um, this is uh, in the category dull, dangerous, and really difficult. Um, this is what we see from a drone flying over pole line. Um, this um, flying over a pole line to take good pictures of components of pole lines that is really hard to do, especially when you fly fast. Um, if you go by helicopter and you're outside of the helicopter with a camera trying to do it, it's also dangerous. And of course it costs a lot of money. So we are have been doing this making AI for um, automating picture taking of, or taking good pictures of components. This is the category industrial inspections. But then we have some um, good friends. They are electric friends, really. Uh, and we have been working with them uh, the past year. And um, probably electric, uh, Jon will talk a bit more about what electric friends do. Yes, this is what um, you probably know us from already, as you've seen in the, in the news. Um, what you do not see here is that there are people sitting in what's in English is called the gallery or in Norwegian and German is called the regi or in America is called the control room uh, with joysticks to operate these robots or uh, saving a shot and then taking it at a later time. But you can go to the next slide. And here you see a prototype of what we are doing, namely that when uh, the person here moves around, we follow him automatically with the camera, not only following, detecting the face and following the face, but also take into, taking into consideration how he is oriented so that we have create talks uh, room in front of the mouth. So you see when he turns to the left, we create talking room on the left hand side. When he turns to the right, we create talking room on the right side. Next slide. This is the block diagram of the system. I come back to some details here, but what you see in the right corner is the advanced shot processing in orange there, which we have made together with Bergen Robotics. And then at the top of this block diagram, you have the user interface. And now we shall have a look at it from the user side. So next slide. This user interface is quite uh, traditional similar to what you will see in the control room at TV2 today from one of our old competitors. Uh, in the case that you have camera selection on the bottom, select camera one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. Um, then you have uh, joysticks, which you cannot see here to, to, to move camera one, two, three, or four. And then you can save the shot, for example, uh, shot number one here being both anchors or shot number two being the weather shot or shot number three being the close-up of the anchor and so forth. What we have done is that we have kept that basic philosophy, but we have introduced what we call advanced shots. And that is shots having much more than only being a place where the rope in, in the room where the robot is being much more than just coordinates for the robot. And the first one here is, we have also something at the top there, which is called keyframes, but that has nothing to do with AI. So it, I dropped that part. Next thing here is uh, 
uh, face tracking. And, uh, and in this case, we see that the face tracking is turned on already in the approach of the person. And then you can see at the bottom right that the face tracking is made so it should Santa or a prime minister knows where the blue dot is in the picture. And then we don't want to track her too closely because then it looks like we are going to shoot her. And we definitely don't want to do that before this corona thing is over. So we must give her some space uh, back and forth. And that's what you see in the non dim area. Uh, so as long as she is within the non dim area, uh, the camera won't move. But once she touches, the margins there, which you can program, the camera will take her back into the center position. Uh, next slide. Here we also have uh, turned on um, this with the with, uh, face pose. So if she knows, turns to the right, she her head will be placed in the golden ratio on the right hand side where you see the blue bar. And if she turns to the left, we will place her where the left blue bar is. This way you create the natural talking room in the shot. And we can go to the next slide. This is something different. This is anchors. And anchors know how to behave in front of a camera. But and, and maybe they sit for 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 hours uh, when they board the anchor for the news to find exactly the nicest position you can have with the anchor uh, with, in combination with the graphics around the, him and so forth. And this is what we want to preserve. So if uh, if the anchor uh, sits correctly, we want to have the camera precisely like that. And this has been attempted in some automation system by inserting the name of the anchor and so forth, but it becomes quite complex when you uh, when you add when you have a lot of chairs in the studio and maybe two anchors at the same time and guests and so forth. But in our case, this becomes very clear and easy. We simply personalize the shot. We see that this is Paul T. Jorgensen. We go to the position program for Jurgensen, and that's it. And that makes the user interface here much cleaner because shot number three here, that's something that works for all anchors. And if you board a new anchor, it takes around 30 seconds to recognize his face and so forth and program that, uh, and we can do a new detection. Finally, what's important with all of this is that you do not need to have an operator in this nice GUI at all. Uh, because an automation like uh, Visa T Mozart can call, for example, take shot number three. And then this system does the rest. Or it can say, take shot number seven, the guest chair. And we uh, look at Anna and we find how she is positioned and we make the correct image. So back to uh, the next slide, <laughs> which is the same as the previous one. This is the block diagram. We've shown the user interface at the top. There is uh, a gallery, uh, which is done in, in German and Norwegian Regie, or control room in, uh, in America. Uh, this has an interface to the, to the automation system. Uh, also, it's uh, to a router control system, so it's multi-studio, multi-gallery. So, for example, the gallery of TV2 in Bergen can control the studio in Oslo and vice versa. Uh, it can also control cameras uh, up in, uh, in the field, as uh, Nils Jakob will talk about in the next slides. And then there is a closed loop at the bottom where you see the... Uh, the orange line going into the advanced process, shot processing, uh, detecting the person or finding out where the person is in the picture, going into the coordinator, which then is a, a, a regulator or a control system. 
which then drives the robotics. And this closed loop can then be local in the in the slalom track or, or wherever, or in, in, in the studio. So thanks so far. Next slide. OK. Um, now we have talked about what's going on in, um, in the studio. And um, um, it has been, um, it, it was a real challenge and real fun to actually make these things work. Uh, the AI and see that, wow, it is working. Um, the next challenge seems to be to make this work outside uh, for sports. Uh, there are already some companies doing sports, but um, let's do it with our AI. Um, in terms of sports, it's, there are some challenges that is not that important in um, a studio setting. And that is that we need more situational awareness. This, um, this thing that we, uh, situational awareness might be things like um, the, um, there happened something that you didn't expect. Um, a good example is the, um, the um, on the um, end of the 50 kilometers run, there was some, um, something important happening, but there might be um, uh, um, somebody falling, something that you didn't know and was not programmed at all. This situational awareness is a challenge and, and we, we see that we need to give, uh, make sure that we, we not only follow uh, scripts, but we can handle um, unplanned events. Um, give you a few examples. Um, two people, um, it's, it's easy to track them. It's the AI do the job, but suddenly they end up with giving them giving hug. And then you end up with two people to becoming one group, and then they um, release and they go somewhere else. It's these kind of in sports where you have close encounters and you try to um, need to make sure that you actually track the right people. That's the challenges. And accidents and all these things that we, we can invent or that we can imagine that sh can happen, make sports uh, challenging. So, and of course, we love challenges. Um, in terms of um, being able to, like in the um, example that I showed first for tracking, um, for tracking um, of finding power li lines from a drone, we need multi-camera solutions so that we have the overview and we have detailed views and all these things together. So um, we envision that the, um, the systems that we are going to make in the coming year will be multi-camera solution and um, a bit more situational awareness than what we have been doing in, in the studio context. So these are uh, kind of challenges that we are um, looking into now and wonder, and uh, look, we also, should I say, we, we say this is, this is a really, really challenge for, for the AI to solve. Okay. Um, what have you seen? Um, we are doing AI, robotics, and broadcast. Um, what we want to achieve uh, to be at least as good as manual operations. We also say that we are going to reduce the cost and equally important, we are going to reduce the stress of the operators in studios and on um, sports, uh, broadcast. And finally, uh, we are also going to enable diversity. Uh, you have prob all probably heard of the long tail, so um, that we can handle or that it will be cost efficient to do even narrow programs, uh, smaller audiences, but with auto AI automation, this will be possible to do uh, same quality as the expensive programs. Okay, 
that was kind of the, uh, well, that is the um, things we wanted to say. It has been an exciting journey so far, and we're looking forward to uh, continue to develop our solutions together with our electric friends. You have thank some you. words in the end, uh, uh, John? No, I just say thank you very much, uh, Nils. Uh, thank you both. Uh, we will have a Q&A uh, at the end, uh, but first uh, we're going to meet uh, IDN, Capgemini, and their client, uh, Ladal Medical. If you, Arturo, start your presentation. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Lars Petter. I am a uh, strategic director in IDN, which is a uh, uh, company owned by Cap Gemini. Uh, I'm just going. Uh, I'm not spending much mu much time uh, in this presentation because uh, Arturo is the one I work with this project and solved it. But, and, but uh, I'm just want to comment on what uh, Eric saw, said uh, that uh, there's a lot of uh, fright, frightening for people are very afraid of AI and. And especially for collateral damage or unintended consequences. But uh, Arturo was showing us a project that is purely for saving life, and it's only a very positive uh, perspective on AI. Yes. I will not use so much time on this slide. Uh, just very brief about me. I come originally from Mexico. I have been living in Norway since 2010 when I came to Trondheim to take a PhD in physics at Antenu. Uh, moved into the to the private sector in 2015, where I have been since, and I have been working since then as a consultant within uh, data, following the evolution of analytics from uh, big data to now AI engineering. Also, uh, I, nowadays, I am also an executive MBA alumni from uh, BI, and I have experience working with uh, different industries like telco, big pharma, medical companies, um, yeah, oil and gas, and so on. So this is the content of what I want to talk to you uh, about today. So I think something that I could be very, very interesting is, um, or, or uh, something I think is valuable to talk about is, um how to use ai how to actually i'm really glad that the hype uh, cycle was mentioned because i think it's a really use, useful tool and there is uh, as i will try to to show you there is some uh, risks with ai nowadays because there is extreme uh, amount of, of hype over hype and uh, it's important to dis to distinguish what is hype what is uh, usable already in, in industrial settings and uh, how basically how to, to use these these as, as tools and I also will, sometimes it's difficult for, for, for companies to, to distinguish where should they utilize AI. And I also will give you some clues into that. And I will just show you at the end uh, an example with a real world example where AI is uh, actually helping uh, saving lives. So what is AI sensing? Uh, and first I want to, to set a little bit of the context or just remind you a bit of the context that we are living nowadays and there is uh, that there are several ongoing revolution technologies uh we, we for example have an internet of things uh now that this is an old slide and this is a perfect example of with of the hype cycle i have been uh, following up the these these numbers and if you see the predictions where uh they had predictions for 2020, and they had, for example, uh, between 40 and, and uh, 50 billion uh, connected devices or IoT devices. And if you look at the statistics now, you see that this was these were inflated expectations, right? But anyway, uh, the Internet of Things uh, it, it is actually a technology that is producing uh, value now in industry. In Norway, we have uh, first minister, minister of the digitization. Um, basically, as he says, everything that will be that can be digitalized will be digitalized. Uh, this, at the same time, this Internet of Things is producing a lot of data. And I will not bore you now with any infographics on, on big data, but yes, there is a big huge. Yeah, we have a lot of sources, uh, really interesting data, data from drones, data from sensors, data from cameras, uh, data from a lot of things. So 
this has been setting up the environment uh, together with with also with the ongoing advancements on on, on hardware that were mentioned already, such as uh, uh, GPU, CPU parallelization, dedicated uh, processing units such as GPUs from Google. All this creates the perfect environment, so that uh, it sounds like the perfect storm, you know. So that there is data, there is hardware, there is uh, technology, and this makes it so that there is a lot of interest. Uh, there is a lot of uh, of uh, economical support. So the best universities in the world, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, all of them are working very intensively with AI, and all of them are opening their their uh, findings. There is also giving giving uh, room to, to this uh, open source uh, ecosystem that that is uh, available now. So when you take all of these things together, you take IoT, you take data, you take uh, AI, you take uh, really powerful powerful uh, processing that can be set on the edge as it's called that doesn't need uh, you know a data center you come you one well, natural consequence is this thing that is called sensor fusion and sensor fusion is when you start taking sensors from these different sources and perfect example is a car uh, self uh, like for example a car uh, such as tesla is full of, of sensors and when you combine some of these sensors and you combine them with a uh, computer vision with uh, Signal processing, such as sound, sound uh, processing, you create, you have the power to create extremely powerful uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems. And I think what I want to show you a bit uh, later in the presentation is one example where you combine such, uh, you, you use such sensor fusion with that, with that, that with advanced uh, AI algorithms. Well, with AI algorithms. But yes, so there is ecosystem. There is the money, there is the attention, there is the overhype. Um, I think it is important for, to take, uh, to, to be aware of the hype cycle, to be aware that there is a lot of uh, inflated expectations. And there's a really useful tool, which is this uh, Gartner hype cycle, right? Uh, basically, this is how it looked for AI. Now, by the way, this was the technology hype cycle until 2019. Team. Now the AI, uh, there is a dedicated AI hype cycle. And then you see in 2020, this is produced towards the, the second half of the year. So COVID had a, a huge cons, uh, impact on, on this, on this uh, hype cycle where uh, there were five new entrants. Uh, one of them now is small data. A small data was really important because uh, basically you have collected, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years of historical data. Say, for example, human mobility. We are uh, we, we are very, uh, we have these routines that repeat all the time when before COVID. We used to go to the office from eight to four, perhaps. And after that, we were perhaps going, we're going to the gym or we're going to have dinner or we're, we're picking up kids. Um, we were really repetitive. Right. So we, we, can, we could uh, predict with high accuracy what a person will be in a normal way. Well, after COVID, and, and this was uh, also what gave uh, room to the introduction of big data, right? As a concept, as a technology, and as, as a pro promised technology. Uh, but now with uh, COVID, really, there is no, no normal. There is really erratic. If I ever go out of, uh, of, my, uh, of my home office, it's... Um, it's kind of spontaneous. So this, this gives rise to the importance of small data and the small data technologies. Uh, algorithms, artificial intelligence that can learn from really small amounts of data. You also have generative AI, which is uh, again in the context of GDPR, for example, there is this really awesome technology called generative adversarial networks, where you can create virtual, uh, imagine you have data for for personal data, take for example NAV or take for example Scott Dutton. They have a lot of information at personal level, but because of GDPR, they are they might not be allowed to train machine learning models on this personal data. Well, with this technology, you can generate a whole country of uh, virtual synthetic people with the same properties as Norwegians, train a model and make predictions on real world data, preserving uh, privacy. And this, of course, composite AI, what I'm talking about, combining sensors, combining the different outputs from different AI uh, technologies uh, to make really powerful uh, products. 
and two mega trends that were present and I think they are still going strong in the, this year is one, the democratization of AI and two, the industrialization of, of AI platforms. So basically you are moving away from uh, driving uh, proof of concepts for the, for the sake of driving proof of concepts and you're moving into taking things to production, Th taking things into a production environment that can deliver value that is automated and don't, that you, so that you don't need uh, 10 data, 10 PhDs, uh, data scientists uh, in your company producing this, this is uh, maintaining these systems all the time. Now, the, the, there is hype, right? And there is, this is a natural cycle. If you are an engineer, you might recognize this as may, perhaps as a damping phenomenon, inflated expectations, which become damped and on, all the, until they normalize into producing value towards, towards the right of the plot. But why is this useful? Well, this is useful because as a company, it might be, it, it, it can uh, perhaps you're a risk hungry company that really wants to be on the edge of technology and use the newest technologies. So then you can really see what could be the key technologies that are perhaps early in the hype cycle that might be a game changer in your industry. And you can start building a portfolio of risk and potential return on investment where of course the lowest risk is in this uh, on the right side, where is the plateau of productivity. But this is basically the, the technologies that all the companies have access to. So it's, it might be a lower return on investment. While the ones that are early in the hype cycle are risky, but as I say, if you really become a, a, an expert in your industry in utilization of these technologies early on, you will have a huge advantage. And of course, just depending on how mature your company is. Are you in the early, uh, do you have an early AI interest? Is your uh, top executives are starting to talk about it? Or, hey, maybe we should start looking into it. Then you, you are in the awareness level. At the level two, you go to the next level. Then you start experimenting with some proof of concepts. Uh, and and as, as it says here, mostly in the data science context. Now there, there is a, a difference being drawn. And this is a difference between having data scientists in a, in a company in a project are having AI engineers in your projects. What we have seen now is that uh, for us, it has become really important to, to pursue, to build up the people and the talent uh, within PAC to, to have these AI engineers. So we, we are not having uh, 20, 30 PhDs as data scientists. We, want, we, we have people that take basically uh, these th technologies into a production environment. Production produce value. And this also takes you to the next level of maturity, which is the operational level. Once you have AI systems that are in a production environment with automated monitoring, uh, perhaps retra automated retraining, uh, the automated life cycle, which is called now MLOps or AI ops, then you are becoming a really mature, uh, a more mature uh, company when it comes to AI. Um, when you just reach this level, the next level, where you have a project and you have uh, you have a well-identified value, value stream or, a, or you have a new potential service and you think, okay, here, how do we automate? How do we enhance with AI? Then, then uh, you're really going to, to you're really a strong and mature uh, company when it comes to AI. And transformational, well, you have here all the Google, uh, Facebook and all these companies that it's just uh, AI is in their DNA, active in the open source community and so on. Okay, but how to work with AI? As I mentioned, uh, something that can be difficult is uh, to first identify what is hype, what is uh, what is uh, really a promising technology, why is overhyped, and where should you start, right? Um, a way uh, we like to start, and um, here my colleagues from IDEA are experts. Uh, is, for example, if you have a service that is uh, facing directly to, with, with, to customers, then you have this concept of uh, a customer journey or a user journey, right? Where basically you, in the context, for example, of uh, buying something, you, you have uh, something, you start by something that is a previous experience, the, the, the biases that you have regarding a, a brand, for example, uh, take, for example, uh, well, my wife and all Norwegians and Grandiosa. 
right? When you think you when you think pizza, the frozen pizza, perhaps you have already something that is uh, this 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 grandiosa, and uh, it is grandiosa's objective to buy this uh, mind uh, room within within the within the customers, right? So that when you are considering buying a pizza, you will think of oh, grandiosa, and then you have the, all the purchase experience, purchase and payment post-purchase, what happens after you eat the pizza? Uh, do you advocate? If I say that I don't like Candiosa, then uh, I, I get the, some friends can really get mad at me because uh, you know it's uh, in their hearts, uh, they have bought their loyalty or they have earned their, their, their loyalty. And this happens with, for example, tel take telco, telco companies, right? They have these really well-studied customer journeys. And where does AI enter here? Why do I care about this? Well because you have key touch points. You have key touch points that can be automated or enhanced with the use of artificial intelligence, uh, all the way from chatbots uh, to maybe intelligent processing in the back end of a customer journey as a key touch points with the customer and also have a, has a back end of processes running internally in your organization, right? So once you map all these uh, touch points with the, with the customer, all the, the processes running in, in, internally in your company, during the customer journey, then you can you can also perhaps uh, look at the polarization. Is uh, the interaction that I'm having with my customer a bit uncomfortable to have with a person? Okay, this is, and is it expensive in addition to have a person uh, in contact being, uh, the, the, in, the key, in the key touch point? Well, this is ideal for, for automation. This is ideal to, to deploy an artificial intelligence uh, agent. And other way is thinking more about you know these value streams. You have a, a well-defined step of well thinking about the ARA model, the uh, actions, resource. Uh, sorry. Okay, you have the you have resources in your company. These are taking certain uh, uh, elements of, of your value creation, and they are basically processing it in a way to deliver value to the customer or to the end user. Again, if you map it very well and you understand it very well, you can see where you can fit uh, AI, perhaps to remove repetitive tasks, perhaps to enhance the task, task uh, the, the, the job of the experts that perhaps are scarce resources in your company. So these are two potential ways to, to start with it. And also an extremely important one, is this of being uh, obsessed with your customers, obsessed with your end users. And this, again, this is an insulting slide for my colleagues at IDM because they can basically, uh, they, they have uh, much more to say about design thinking. But this is something that we have seen that companies use and it can be the differentiator between a successful uh, implementation of an AI service and an unsuccessful one. And it, design thinking is about understanding, understanding very well the needs of customers or the needs of users, and then having this non-linear iterative cycle where you are going to uh, understand, idea, uh, explore the, the, all here that you see my mouse, my mouse from to the left is what is called the problem space and what is to the right is what is called the solution space. And in the problem space is all about empathizing with customer, understanding their pain points, understanding what drives them, what inspires them in order to come with uh, ideas in order how to actually use AI or any other solution, uh, technology perhaps, or process to deliver value to the customers. And especially with that, it's important to have this human-centered uh, point of view. And now it, we can see it in action. So there are companies uh, that have taken this concept and Lardal is one of them. They are super committed with design thinking and uh, human-centered uh, design. And they have this, this uh, extremely advanced set of devices. I think they are best in, in, in class uh, at a global level. Um, these are smart devices. These, these are devices with IoT uh, sensors. And the IoT sensors include, for example, uh, volume to measure the vent quality of the ventilations, have pressure and accelerometers to, to measure the compressions that you're delivering to, to these maniquees. And all of this is analyzed real time with, with, uh, with an app. And then 
what we did is we came in basically, okay, yes, you have, uh, they identified, they, you can, I don't know if I would call it value stream, but it is definitely a process. They have the CPR process, the quality CPR process. And this is a process that has several uh, important KPIs, metrics that need to be fulfilled in order for you to, to, to actually deliver quality CPR. And deliver, the difference between, between delivering CPR and deliver, delivering quality CPR is having a probability of reanimating a person from 5% to up to 55, 60% probability of reanimation. So what did we do? We identified these uh, metrics, these importance maneuvers that the CPR people need to do. We have a set of sensors and we can enhance it with a set of AI uh, modules. And that's what we did. One, okay, because of the noise, I will stop it. Uh, one of them is the hovering technique. Hovering technique is to come as close as possible to the chest of a person without touching it while they are delivering a shock, electrical shock. Why is it important? Because if you're really close to it, you can start compressions right away after the, the, the shock is delivered, but you do, not, you do not touch it because if you touch it, you get electrocuted, right? So then we have this, um, this system where, as you see, it's defying the, 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 the maneuver, right? Also, we have, it is important to understand how these people dance in the scene. So uh, as you can see here, we have, a, we have a system that is identifying the roles of the different persons in the scene, ventilator, compressor, and a, uh, automatic electric defibrillator uh, operator, and when they rotate. Because when they rotate, it's also a, it's a, thing, it's a metric that needs to be measured. Plus, we have a sound recognition system that basically what does is that it will recognize where the, the When the cue for, for delivering a shock is, is uh, de delivered by the machine, the, the system will recognize it. And just, uh, well, you combine all of these things, the sensor, the output from the sensors, the output from the computer vision uh, system, you combine them all, to, all together, you can really provide feedback or really uh, fast feedback that, that is important that the, 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 the trainees receive it right after they are done with, it, with the session. Um, if you are interested, I think I'm over time. If you are interested in this, go to Lardo's web webpage and you can find more about the system, which uh, they, they have taken to, to production. It is already in an app and it's uh, helping uh, saving lives. Um, thank you very much, uh, Arturo and uh, Lars Petar. Uh, is there any questions? I know Eric has to, had to leave, but uh, there is open for questions. Uh, to uh, electric friends, Bergen Robotics, and IDN and Capgemini, if there are any. If not, uh, we have a, another um, webinar about two weeks. Uh, then it's going to be in Norwegian, and it's going to be PVC talking uh, about the road to responsible AI. Uh, addressing a lot of those questions Eric in the start uh, talked about. If there is no questions, then I'll thank you all for, but uh, here is, comes a question. Uh, can you share a LinkedIn contact information for who? <laughs> Uh, we will uh, distribute this uh, um, webinar uh, at our pages and uh, we will publish it on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. And if we are lucky, maybe we can get some of the content that they have presented for downloading on PDF also. Thank you very much.